There are lots of difficult things in this life, so why is it that we let conversations be so hard? Are we so afraid to say the wrong things that we resign to say nothing at all and cause ourselves extra hardships? My guest has a path out of this treacherous swamp and into a better life. Welcome to the Just Dumb Enough podcast, a show that acknowledges no one is always an expert by dispelling common misconceptions with real experts. I'm your host as always, Colton Petrie. My guest today is Gavin Fry. Gavin has spent the last 40 years as a spiritual therapist and leadership mentor. It's a journey that started with a remarkably tough childhood that tempered his resolve towards becoming a better person than his upbringing dictated. Our conversation today is rich with simple tips and example sentences to enhance any relationship in your life quickly and easily. Remember, you can email dumbenoughpodcast at gmail.com or send a message to any of the social media pages to request future topics or guests. For now, let's speak up. Welcome to the show, Gavin Fry. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast, and I'm really struck by how you framed it just dumb enough and the arena that we're going to be talking about you and me today that I'm going to be sharing about it lends itself to coming to it as a rookie as if you don't know anything because it's when we think we know we often get in the way particularly when it comes to intimate relationships good then we're going to be in the right mindset for today thank you so much again for being on the show why don't you introduce yourself for the audience sure my name is Gavin Fry And for the last 40 years, I've been a spiritual therapist, and I've also been a leadership mentor to entrepreneurs. And so I was catapulted into this career when I was in my teens because I grew up with a brother who was a white supremacist gang leader and a murderer, and my sister was a heroin addict. So I had a very traumatic teen years. I think most of us face trauma of some kind. Mine was somewhat extreme. It was hard for me. The good news is it catapulted me into psychology and spirituality and me finding that I had gifts of compassion and empathy and that I was a sensitive man that had a gift for counseling. So my clients I work with, when they're in the midst of tremendous pain or change or desire to head in a new direction, and I get to be their partner in that journey. Yeah, and that's incredible because that is a difficult background to come from like not everyone you know makes it out of having those relationships with a a good calm intact mindset like you do yeah i would love to say that all of that trauma is completely healed and it doesn't surface anymore but i i it's it's not my sense for myself and the and the and the work that i do that the things that happen to us that shake us that that put a mark on us they become part of our signature And they have a tendency to resurface in subtler ways as we go along. There's something we have to keep an eye on. Like for me, because my brother and sister's path was so dramatic and they were older than me, what I felt behind them was neglected because my parents were so ensconced in all handling all of that. They, it never occurred to them like, how is this for you? And how are you doing? And I was really struggling and it was really hard, but I contributed to that by trying to pretend that I was okay. I put up a front that I was fine. I got good grades, but I wasn't fine. I mean, it was really, it was, it got pretty dark there for me. So part of the path of me moving through into my, through my trauma and, and healing was recognizing the way I adapted to that trauma by pretending that I was fine. So it doesn't work for me now to pretend that I'm fine. A lot of my work is is anchored in authenticity and being willing to have the courage to be honest about what's going on in your relationships, with your coworkers, with clients. It's just so, like you told me you had a cold getting over not being feeling well. And you could just tell me that and you don't have to pretend like you're 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 fine. So there's something liberating when we can allow ourselves to have what's going on on the inside 
match our expression on the outside. And the topic that we're talking about today that we're planning to talk about was courageous conversations, the keys to intimate relationships. So a lot of that arena of work, and we can talk more about it, is about being authentic. It's like honest, caring, sharing. The natural byproduct is intimacy. But if you're not honestly sharing, then you're going to feel separated and you're going to have challenges in the relationship. Yeah. And I think that's how most of us kind of go about life, right? Like we don't, we feel uncomfortable having these conversations. So we do just stay quiet. We put kind of a mask on and we say like, yeah. everything's fine. I don't need to talk about anything because everything's great. And inside yeah. you're like, if I bring this up, it's going to be so uncomfortable and I'm going to hate it. They're going to hate it. And they're going to look right. at me different. It's going to be bad. Colton, I've been working with couples for 40 years, and that's the epidemic problem, is couples think a couple of things. One, they think, I should avoid bringing up something that will upset my partner, and that's going to be, it's going to serve the relationship. And I can only tell you, it's the royal route road to ruin and to divorce, because then your partner doesn't know you, and you don't know you, and it starts to be more of a facade. And the other thing is most people grew up concluding that if there's upset in a relationship, then it means the relationship isn't for you or it isn't a good relationship. My experience is exactly the opposite. One of the criteria of success for a healthy relationship is that partners get upset with each other from time to time. Because in the getting upset, like let's say your partner does something, they, they show up late for dinner and then you get triggered. If that can be talked about in a constructive, vulnerable way, you can actually grow closer because of it versus avoiding it. So my experience is couples to have a, a flourishing relationship, each cup, each partner needs to be aware of who they are, what their patterns are, what their needs are, take good care of themselves. And then all of what they do flows into the relationship to be healthy rather than trying to pretend that everything's fine all the time. I became an expert at that in my teens, and I've had to really unlearn that. It's definitely something that we do, right? Like you said, you know, being upset, being kind of that energized behavior in your relationship is a good thing because think about the opposite of it, right? If we were just all very like flat all the time with our partners, you would have the most boring relationship in the world. Yes, it's true. If we're going to have an authentic, loving relationship, part of the, the trick or the nature of that kind of relationship is embracing it all. So, for example, in that the example I gave of, let's say, you're late to dinner, out to dinner with your wife, 20 minutes late. So imagine if you get to, to dinner, you say, I'm sorry, I'm late. She says, I hear you. She goes, can I just talk for a little bit? You say, sure. She goes, I just want to let you know what happened to me when you were late. As the minutes wore on, I started to feel abandoned. I started to feel hurt. I started to wonder if you cared about me. I wondered why you didn't text me. And I started to feel vulnerable about that. And I just wanted to let you know that. I don't want to pretend that didn't happen. Sometimes that happens in our relationship. I'm sensitive to how you treat me. And it can be sometimes raw in particular ways. And I'm letting you know that. Now, how would you feel towards your wife if she approached you that way? I feel like I definitely understand the conversation a whole lot better than if we just sit down and there's just this air, right? Yeah. It's just like thick yeah. with tension. Yeah, that's right. Well, and you might even, when someone confides in me and they have the courage to, to risk being honest like that, like when someone even says, there's something I want to talk to you about, but it's it's a little scary for me to do that. My experience inside of me is, wow, they are about to bless me by telling me what's really going on. And I'm just, just wide open because I know it takes courage. So, that, you know, to have a, a, a vibrant relationship and to have courageous conversations, it does involve doing what's uncomfortable. There's no question. And But both partners need to understand that, Upset and getting triggered is a healthy part of a relationship. It's how you handle it. So when it, when it happens, 
You can even say to your partner, you know that thing that Gavin talked about where sometimes we'll get triggered? That just happened, and I'd like to talk about that. Just go, oh, okay. Because usually we default into withholding or we blame the other person or we make them wrong, and then there's a defensiveness, and then you add to the problem. So it's actually fairly simple. It's kind of the way you, you would see kids work it out in a sandbox. You know, they get upset with each other and then they cry and they talk about it. They might hit each other a little bit and then they then they're done and they just go on playing. You know, they, they don't pretend it didn't it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, they, they haven't learned all of our bad habits yet, but we're like, yeah. no, this is this is the socially acceptable thing is to pretend it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I guess the opposite side is like, can we go too triggered, too high energy like because I know I've I've watched people where they haven't communicated obviously for a long time. Right. And then they just like blow up on each other. Exactly. Well, you can imagine I have people being a therapist, working with couples, married couples. They they're already in serious trouble in the relationship. They've been there for a while. And then they show up on my doorstep, my office. So I have to set up some ground rules. It's not like it's not okay to be upset. It's okay to be upset. But how you talk about the upset, it can be talked about as a blaming or an attack. And sometimes it's like that because we've withheld for so long. So it's it's a part of keeping a vibrant, healthy relationship. Like my first wife and I had an agreement that worked really well. Is we had an agreement that there would be no withholds from each other. That doesn't mean the mundane little withholds, like I don't like the curvature of your large toe. But if you, you're upset by something and then something says, I should talk about it. And you go, no, 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 I won't talk about it. Well, I should talk about it. No, 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 I won't talk about it. If we, if we keep our house clean in the relationship by risking talking about it, where you can look at your partner and says, is there anything that we haven't talked about? And you know that you're both keeping it clean. Boy, that's a healthy way to go. It's the withholds and the holding back that you're right. As you said, it builds resentment. And this supplies whether it's your wife or your business partner or your clients or your kids. It's all the same dynamic, truly. But I think most people can think of a time where they're like, it was something small, probably. Right. And we just didn't talk to it with the other person. Didn't have to be your romantic partner, but even your friend, you just didn't talk about it. Right. And then it continued to just like sit there in your mind and you'd think about it every once in a while. And yes. then it became a bigger problem. And when you finally do talk about it, you just like, it's now the largest problem in your entire relationship with this person. Yes. Yes. Well, and then often at that juncture, there's a decision made. There's a problem with the relationship and this person. And so I think I won't be with them anymore and I'll get a divorce. And then we go get another partner, but then we don't talk to them either. And the same pattern happens. It's like a serial relationship. And it's the process is what needs to be appreciated. But here's there's another advantage to all of this, Colton, that I want to talk about. And that is an intimate relationship has two purposes. One is the joyful companionship of creating our lives together and sharing the journey. It's very, very rich. But the second is for the relationship to help each partner grow. We actually choose our partners that might actually trigger us in ways that help us heal what we took on before we even met them. So the, the relationship can become almost like a spiritual practice or a, an evolutionary path. So when you start to see your wife and you see her, let's say, have the courage to talk to you about things when they're happening and you do the same, and then you see the relationship grow, but you see each other grow, and then maybe you risk even more. Like if I'm working with someone, a couple on their lovemaking relationship, in addition to not talking about things that you think might upset your partner, we often withhold on what we want and requesting what we want. So when they come my way, I create a safe space. I encourage risking, but even risking not just what I'm upset about, what would I like that I'm not getting? Can we, she might say, can we spend more time on foreplay? Because I really, I haven't wanted to say anything to you because I don't want to hurt your feelings. 
but how would you know if I don't tell you? I love it when you do this and this for this amount of time. For some reason, that just works for me. So you as the partner go, wow, this is great. I mean, how am I supposed to know? Because I'm over here guessing. I'm just dumb enough not to know what the hell to do, right? <laughs> so somehow transparency, honesty, making requests, confessing, golden territory in my line of work. Yeah, it feels like we so often we try something out, right? right. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try, you know, a new like pet name or I'm going to try saying something new during the day and maybe that'll make whoever my partner is feel better or whatever it might be. And then we don't get any feedback. And mm -hmm. so we're like, oh, I don't think they like that. I'm not going to do that anymore. And then later on, we have a conversation with these people where they're like, yeah, you know, I really miss when you used to do this thing. <laughs> right. And you're like, I thought you hated that thing. It's like, I, I stopped know. doing it because you never said anything about it. Right. So there's a misunderstanding where you just miss each other. So that's where I, I'm a strong believer in couples educating each other about who we are. The other thing I've realized that's a very key indicator of whether a relationship is flourishing or not is the recognition by both partners that there are two, let's say two relationships going on. One partners have partner A is having their experience of the relationship. Partner B is having theirs. They're not supposed to be the same. There's two. So even if they go to a party and they're driving home, Partner A may go, that was one of the best parties I've ever been to. I love that party. I like this, I like this, and I like this. Partner B goes, I had a really difficult time at that party. This is one of those times where I felt shy. I felt insecure and anxious. I didn't confess it to you because I was embarrassed about it. I kind of wandered around. I had a little too much to drink, and it was lonely. And this is something I can do. But And so if if partner A can express their experience and be heard, but also be curious and cherish their partner's experience too. So the one that had a great time would go, wow, God, I really hear you. I, I wish I'd have known. I'm sorry. You know, it's like, is there more you want to talk about with that? Is there anything you need? Can I, can I give you a massage on the way home? Do you want to talk about it more? So if there's these two experiences that are different, as they go through life and learning about how different they are rather than assuming they're the same. There's a man that, that I heard a, a quote Colton once and, and the man said he'd been married for 30 years. He said, I know my wife so well, I don't know her at all. Now what he meant by that is he gets up in the morning. He hasn't met the wife that morning. He doesn't know what she's going through that morning, what she might like to have, how she would like to have her eggs. So being innocent and curious rather than having her in a box. Sometimes we put, put ourselves each other in a box and the intimacy and the fulfillment in the relationship goes down because we're humans. We're discovering new things all the time. We're always evolving. And if we've got a partner that's really curious about, you know, what's, what our experiences of life or our career or of our kids and then listen to each other. There's something deeply fulfilling about that. You get to, you get to actually taste your journey and your partner's journey. And there's no reason to expect that you should have identical experiences because even if I took me, I exactly duplicated myself for whatever reason I'm dating myself in this relationship. We go to two different jobs and come back at the end of the day. We just had two very different experiences. That's Even right. as the same person, I can't expect to be like talking to myself as if we had the exact same day. Right. And where this gets really where I appreciate the value of this even more is if there happens to be a flare up or tension or words spoken with each other and, and there's tension and it escalates. Every, every couple has their own way of doing that from time to time. So when that happens, if maybe you take a time out for a little bit, but you get back together, one of the best things to do is set up a structure 
where one person talks at a time and talks about their experience. Because typically we try to talk and we go back and forth and we get derailed. Both partners don't get heard. But let's say partner A goes and goes, well, let me tell you what happened for me 10 minutes ago. And then you and the person listening is not looking to be right. It's not looking to score points. They're trying to understand almost like they're they're with their wife, almost like they're they're an alien from another planet. It's like, I want to know what went on for you. I'm curious. I'm genuinely curious. And then you listen and you and you hear back. You go, oh, this you thought I meant this and I thought I meant this. Oh, OK. Then they feel heard. And then they listen while you talk about your experience then you can grow together through you grow through the challenging encounters you learn things about each other you get more intimate it's like we don't really ever get practice in listening to each other right. we listen to each other in the way that you listen to like a survey where you're like as soon as they stop talking i just need to give the correct answer and yeah. then the faster i can give correct answers or solve this math problem the sooner this is all resolved. Yes. And it's like, that's not how you actually deal with problems or even just like listening about someone's day. Yeah. Like you shouldn't be listening to someone else's day just to be like, and the answer's two, done. Right, right. Or I, I'm trying to think about what I have to say when you're done or, or, or I'm thinking that I need to fix it or I need to do something versus you're, you're, you're highlighting something really, really important, Colton. It's, all of us, I've never met anybody that gets listened to enough where they feel genuinely heard. And part of that, a big part of that and a big part of my profession, my skills is curiosity and empathy. I'll hear what someone says. And when I reflect it back to them, it's, it's wow, it sounds like you're really not feeling well. And it kind of feels a little bit like you're underwater and you're not real comfortable in your body. And they go, yes, that's exactly how I feel. There's something so rewarding about that. And most of us don't know how to ask for it. We're still learning how to do it. And we're still appreciating how meaningful it is when we can be heard. Um, and and that, that to me, that, you know, that intersection between two wildly different people, two different experiences, listening and cherishing each other's experience is what leads to golden intimacy in the relationship. Even if you don't agree with it, you might say, God, how you feel about that, I don't really even understand, but let me make sure I understand how it is for you. You know, and then they get honored versus arguing about reality, which is so dysfunctional. You know, when I, in my work with couples, I, there's never any blame. If it starts to move off into blame, I go, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not doing blame. What we're doing is we're doing learning. We're learning about each other. We're learning about ourselves. This is, we're students here. I'm a student of you two. You two are a student of yourselves and each other. It's that curiosity, studentship. Wow. I mean, it's just like what your podcast is. It's just dumb enough, you know? Yeah. It seems like so much of, what happens in these when you start having that argument where I'm listening to you explain this is it's like, I have to defend my, the image I have of myself. Right. That's right. Like if I don't defend that image and it all falls apart, things are going to go horribly wrong, you know, for both parties involved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're right. And so then the ego is having an argument and what gets missing when that occurs for both or either is vulnerability. So let's say you're tempted to defend based on what she says. You can even start when it's your turn. You could say, I must confess, part of me wants to defend what I did after hearing what you have to say. Now, I'm not going to do that, but I, I'm, I can tell I'm a little defensive. I'm a little tender over here. But let me also tell you what I learned about you from all that you shared. Did I get it right? Because it isn't really about being right or wrong. There's no intimacy in right or wrong or being on a position. Yeah, there's no scoreboard when you're having a discussion with your partner. No, no, there, it's it's not it's not it's not it's not win lose. It's it's called how can we listen to each other, learn from this, 
maybe even what comes out of it is she might make a request the next time if you happen to be late for dinner and it's past five minutes if you would please text me that would that would be really nice for me i would feel appreciated by that and then you go oh okay and then there's a request so there's a learning that comes out of it yeah yeah it's kind of looking at everything like there's no win lose situation specifically like you either win as your like interaction either it's you or your friend you or your partner whoever it is you either win together or you lose together right so which one do you want to put the energy into yeah well so so my work is teaching people how to strengthen their relationship when conflicts happen because it's a golden opportunity for learning because it's kind of like those videos where you see two rams where they're hitting heads you know you know and that's often what happens is both partners will get triggered at the same time about something that's when it's the, the most difficult one of the things that i like to help people learn to do is if the tension is high where there's upset or anger or you're tempted to mouth off or say something or attack if one or both of you can realize the temperature is pretty hot here let's take a time out the same way a kid would take a time out when they're really upset so let's let's just let's just take a break from each other for half an hour maybe one of us takes a walk then we'll come back and then one of us will talk the other will listen and then one of us will talk and the other will listen if it starts to escalate again because it's maybe it could be heated territory about how to parent or about money and it could get heated you always want to de-escalate and take a break and then come back some people really like to argue when they're escalated but it starts to be destructive it's not helpful it's it's best to de-escalate take a time out come back be calm doesn't mean you can't still have deep feeling but you're less you have less of a tendency to be reactive and uh, harsh towards your partner impatient is part of that that it feels so uncomfortable and i'm just thinking about personal interaction it feels so uncomfortable most of the time to have these breaks in the dialogue where you say something and if i really want to listen to it sometimes there is just quiet where i'm mm -hmm. thinking about what you said mm -hmm. and trying to form a response based on that and it leaves this dead space in the conversation mm -hmm. because i've been on both sides of that and it can be you know prior to having experience with this show like dead space was a little uncomfortable right right well see even at that moment you can say I'm taking in what you're saying and I'm finding I think I need to reflect on it a little bit before I respond. And is that okay? Yeah, because otherwise, you know, you look at the other person who's just suddenly quiet and maybe they're not yeah. making eye contact anymore. And you're like, are you angry? Are you upset? Did I say something wrong? And, you know, the person who's thinking is like, I need to say something. I got to say something right now because I've been quiet for so long. And like the emotion that you have in that draws out every second beyond, you know, like the 10 seconds you're probably going to be quiet for. Yeah. 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 Well, the key when you do take a time out is to have a clear understanding that you will be getting back together again and addressing it. But, and, and sometimes one person wants to keep talking and the other one is not prepared. Maybe they're, they're not prepared for the heat, but typically de-escalation is going to be really helpful particularly if it isn't used just as an avoidance to move away from talking about it and then never coming back to it. You know, so you say, can we check in in a half an hour? This is important. I know this isn't easy. Can we, can we go at it? Can we, can we open up the conversation again? Yeah. And how would you deal with, you know, if, if one partner is utilizing that to just avoid talking about things? Yeah. Well, if you, if you saw it happen four or five times in a row, you can say, you know, I notice there seems to be, this is from my perspective, there's a pattern where we'll have conflict, we'll start to talk about it, and then we do that thing that Gavin recommended where we take a, a break to de-escalate, but I notice that you're not coming back around to complete it. Is, is Do we have an agreement about that or do we not? Because that's going to be really important to me because I don't want to have just the avoidance of conflict be our pattern. I want to learn how to heal and and be students of each other and complete things. 
and maybe even come into a decision if there's a decision involved. But what you don't want to do is attack the person, say, you know, you always run. I don't like that. That's not going to be really helpful. So the more you can share your own direct experience and vulnerability, like I'm confused. I thought we said we were going to get back together, but three or four times now we haven't. And I just wonder, is this how you want to play or how do you want to do that? Because I'm confused now. Yeah. It built this image in my mind where I'm sure that I have seen people do it. And I'm sure I've heard about it a lot in like dramatizations of things where they say like, well, I don't want to do this thing with this partner because if they, if they see me, they see the real me and how I handle these situations, they're going to realize they're too good for me and they're going to leave. Ah, yeah. So in other words, one partner has an insecurity or an unworthiness, maybe even a fear of being left. And all I can tell you, Colton, is the very best way to handle that is for that partner to tell their partner that. Because usually when that's going on in a partner, they also feel like, and I could never tell them that I feel this way. Because then that would just, I mean, that would just be too scary because then the whole relationship may be over because they might go, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe I, maybe I don't feel good about being with you. I think part of the challenge of dealing with conflict and upset in relationship is it can feel so scary because you actually, it feels like you're putting the relationship on the line when you take the risk because you really don't have control over what the other person's going to do. But here's the fallacy in that. By not sharing it, you can guarantee the relationship will be diminished and there'll be more separation and there'll be less intimacy. Yeah, I mean, it's it definitely is. Like, if you share that with your partner, they might also feel the same way. They're like, oh, I didn't think, like, I thought you were way too good for me. Yeah. And that's that's how we, like, <sighs> we're both feeling that way. Obviously, it's, it can't be true because we can't both be too good. Yeah. Because it's crazy to think that you could, you're dreaming in your head about carrying on a conversation or the relationship for 20 years with this giant sword hanging over your head where you're like, boy, at any minute, they're going to realize they're too good for me. And this is all going to fall apart. Right. And it's, but it's all private, almost this private looming, walking next to a cliff feeling. But imagine if you said it and risked it, she says, I have something similar, but by acknowledging it, it lifts off. It's no longer in the relationship. And it might be two weeks later, you might say, you know, I'm starting to feel that thing again. I just wanted to acknowledge it because it was so liberating to acknowledge it two weeks ago. I'm just letting you know if I start to feel it a little bit so I can just keep letting it go because obviously it's a story I'm making up. It's not true. Yeah, we make up untrue stories. Yeah, of course we do. Like yeah. that is just our nature. Like we catastrophize everything in our head to be the worst case scenario. Yeah, but if in a, in a healthy relationship, it's like an altar. You can bring things like to confession and just say, "I need to take a risk and share something with you." I'm, this is hard for me to say, but shh, you know, I I think that you're not attracted to my upper body. I, I need just I don't know if that's true or not. I just I'm running that. And I need to confess it because I don't want to run it around in my head anymore. Gets in, gets in my way whenever we get into bed with each other. It reminds me of like the stereotypical thing that I've heard where they're like, you just will not let this go. Right. Like, is there too, is there honestly too <laughs> often a thing that you can bring up? Uh, see, I, I don't think so because see, see if you, let's say you're the one that's insecure that she is too good for you and she may leave you and you bring it up the first time. And it's like, and then she says, well, I have a little bit of that too. So if it comes up for you again, by bringing it up, all you're doing is you're talking about your process. Let's say you bring it up weekly for two months. Then your partner goes, you know, this thing, this thing seems to be troubling you a little more than you'd like. Have you considered doing some journaling or have you considered seeing a counselor about this? Because it sounds like it's an unconscious pattern or something that's in you that's kind of got a groove in there 
and it's uh and it might need a little more work but you can see that's a supportive response to help you with the way you're being troubled because she cares about you yeah but she she also can't control whether that thing gets released you get to determine if you need additional uh, tools or assistance to release it well and it's what we talked about earlier you know some of these conversations especially for people who've never practiced this kind of behavior are really hard to bring up yes so if you think you're hearing it really often imagine how often it's playing out in their head that's right that's right that's right so really safety in the relationship can allow both partners to confess and unburden themselves acknowledge things that are going on under the surface and then you've got a partner that you feel really safe it also reaffirms that your partner loves you because they they you're telling them everything you're not just trying to paint a good picture and withhold certain things and paint a pretty picture you're saying i want i want to know that you're with me because you know me not some caricature i'm trying to, to sell on you but yeah. it's still scary to share those things yeah of course it is like yeah. it's deeply personal and we you know, we take those things and we're like, this is a piece of myself. And if I remove it and show it to everybody, like it, it diminishes who I am. It can feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I realized, there's a chapter in my book. Um, and I have just finished a book, the real you leading your life from your authentic self. So it's with authenticity. So it's called Multi multiplicity of selves, healing our inner family. And what it does is it speaks to a paradigm of recognizing that we're many different aspects inside. We could have an aspect inside that's supremely confident most of the time. Insecurity is a non-issue, but maybe once a month, certain circumstances happen, go to a party, whatever it is, and then an insecure place starts to just make itself known. Now, it doesn't invalidate all the confidence. They both exist. And sometimes we have places that are 180 degrees from other places. It'd be like when we're going to be looking at a career change. One part of us is ready and excited to move into the new thing. Another part of us is scared to make any change. And then they want to, we want to stay with the comfortable. I say get in touch with both of those places. Listen to both of them. Let them find a way to work it through. But it's not like we're only one person. We're, we're layered. It's, it's intricate. Yeah, and you could find that there are some overlap in those, I imagine, where you're like, okay, well, I'm comfortable in my old job. And it's like, okay, well, what makes you comfortable about it? That you've been there a long time? Because if you don't go to this new job, you'll never have been there for a long time. Mm. Or is it you're comfortable in this job because you know what you're doing? Like, okay, well, if you're applying to a new job, assumably leaving your old job, you probably know what you're doing in this new one, too. It just feels different. But yeah. you still have that. You still yeah. know what you're doing. Well, and, and see, the, the way you're talking about that, that, about how the process evolves with different places, when I work with people in, in, in my counseling sessions, I'll put two chairs facing each other. One chair will be the voice that says, I want to stay in the job. The other is, I want to go. And they don't just talk. They need to talk to each other. So the one that wants to go looks over and goes, gosh, I'm so frustrated. You always, you don't want to make risk. You don't want to make change. But then it might also say, but you are the sensitive part of me. You're the part that wants to make wise choices. So how can we work together? And then you start learning about both parts learn about each other and they start to work in a unified direction. And sometimes creative solutions occur, you know, like, if we're, let's say it's about a move to a new town, instead of just selling our house and then going and looking for a new house, what if we take a three week trip to the new town, me and my wife, and then we, we, we check it out. We explore it a little more. So we get a little more confirmation that it feels like the place to go and we take it gradually. So there's all kind of creative solutions, but I'm just speaking about how we can have different voices and aspects inside. And it's, it's important to honor all of them. And some of them feel vulnerable. 
Yeah, of course they do. And it leads into, I had a really good listener question that had asked, where did they put it? Um, They had asked, like, where should I draw the line with my privacy from my partner? And I think yeah. that's a really good question because it's like, you know, we're talking a lot about, you know, sharing things with your partner and especially yeah. like not having these big secrets. Is there a place where you're like, it's okay to just have this for me? Whatever yeah. this thing is, I can just have this for me. I think I think it can be healthy to have a private world and a private life versus a requirement that you share everything with your partner. And the only way to determine what to share and what not to share is your own intuition and guidance about what works best for you. And sometimes you may learn by making a mistake. You may share something and you go, you know what? I really wished I had not shared that. For example, let's say you have a partner. Let's say you're a woman is dating a man and the man can get insecure about previous men that the woman has been with. So the woman is very happy being with the man she's with now, but she has happy memories of some kinds with previous men, different parts of their relationship. But she's learned if she starts talking about that, her partner just gets insecure. It doesn't really serve a purpose. She starts comparing and compa you know, comparing. So you learn, you go, I'll keep this part of my memory of that relationship with me. It's not necessary to share it. It doesn't serve me and it doesn't serve my partner. So in a way, it's kind of a practical question of what works. But if you don't share something and you find that it troubles you in your relationship with your partner because you're not sharing it, I'm not saying you have to share everything, but you might want to risk sharing some of it or leading into it and see if that relieves some of the tension inside of you. Because our, you know, an intimate partnership, you live with each other. And if there are things that you're hiding because you're uncomfortable, it's going to influence the relationship. Um, so sometimes we want to keep things private because we are protective and they're, they're areas that are hurt. And we try to just pretend or make them go away. That's why I'm saying if there is hurt in the relationship or there's a conflict it's often best to talk about it so it doesn't just accrue and build up to be a bigger issue. Yeah. I would say, you know, check what you're thinking about because if you are thinking about your past relationship and your partner's uncomfortable with hearing some of these things, think about the exact, whatever the process is in your head, right? For this specific question, like, is what you're thinking about a lesson you learned from having this previous relationship and something you want to, like, make sure that your partner knows that you figured out, right? Like, yeah. I made yeah. a discovery. Listen, yeah. or is, is it just a memory that you enjoy? Because if yeah. it's a memory you enjoy, you don't have to share those things. Right, right. But you make a very good point. See, I actually like when I'm with a woman talking about our our, our history because it's not about the person or even the memory. It's what did I, what did they learn about relationship? It's like in that relationship, I learned not to betray myself. And those, and that's about me. That's something I want you to know about me. It's important that I stay true to myself. And that's where I learned it. Because some of this, and I'll give like the silly example, because I have one about like having a weird privacy, um, I found a thing that I enjoyed reading and I kept it from my partner because I was like, no, this is the thing I enjoy reading. Mm. And then I found out that she was reading it too. And I was like, oh, it's not my private thing anymore. Uh. And I was like upset for a minute total mm. where I was like, I can't believe it's not just my thing. And then I was like, why am I upset about this? <laughs> I didn't need to have a private reading session for myself. <laughs> Well, see, I have a wondering, because, you know, the way I think, given my background, I have a wondering if, for example, you might have had growing up, um, you didn't necessarily have a private life. You might have had a mother or somebody that was intruding on or a father that was intruding on on everything, wanted to know all of your business and would keep pushing in and didn't respect your boundaries. And so now, even with the smallest of boundaries, somehow it feels like it feels good to have your own space that 
everybody isn't invited in and knows about. Or you could have had a brother that was, you know, always taking your comic books, you know, things like that, you know, where your own, some people with a lot of brothers and sisters have that, you know, it's like, God, I just, I just want my own space. I want my own life. Yeah. I think it's interesting actually, like hearing you pose, okay, maybe this is why you feel that way Mm -hmm. because it makes me think about it. I didn't think about that. I haven't thought about that in years Ah. since it happened. Ah. Uh, when I do sit and think about it, I think it's actually the opposite Ah, because I had a period of my life where my parents were basically absent from my life. Like they weren't uh. a part of anything. So whatever I was enjoying, whatever I was doing, it was always just for my sake. So I'm like, oh, this is just a thing for me. Ah, And so I think I was just used to having like, oh, this is only a thing that I will like, that I will enjoy. It's anytime I'm doing it, it's just because it's for me. And I can't like, I wasn't embracing the fact that I could now have a conversation about a thing I was enjoying with someone else. Yeah. Well, but you, you bring up a very good point. It's like during that period of your life, if you were enjoying something, it was crystal clear to you. It, you were enjoying it because you were enjoying it. You weren't doing it because they favored it. So I, I do think in relationship, it's very healthy for each partner to have interests, hobbies, friendships you know go to spain for two weeks and have have their own rich existence that isn't all relationship woven together with and then and when each partner does that it really serves the relationship versus saying we just do everything together we wear the same kind of shirts together we go on the same vacations all the time i you know i think there's a lot of value for most partners and couples where they have their own life inwardly and outwardly that's not, you know, woven so cl- closely in with their relationship. Yeah, it is one of those where you see a couple wearing matching T-shirts on the <laughs> same vacation, eating the same foods. I'm like, when was the last time you just did something by yourself? Because you yeah. look real tight knit, which is good for you. But uh, have you had any alone time recently? <laughs> yeah. Might there be growth growing in that direction? Yeah, blink twice if you're held hostage. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, Colton. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think this has been great. I've loved having you on the show. I appreciate yeah. it immensely. I wanted to give some time to plug, you know, your book and where people can find you if they're looking for more. Sure. Well, the book just was released. It's it's going to be sent out on November 20th, and it's called The Real You, Leading Your Life from Your Authentic Self. And it's all about the world of the authentic self how we develop a false self in response to trauma, how we can rediscover the the, the authentic self because it's unique to each of us, many, many different pathways. And then once we come into a deeper connection with our authentic self, we often start to discover gifts and a calling and vision and how we can support and serve other people. It's just a natural process. So my website is gavinfry.com, G-A-V-I-N-F-R-Y-E.com. And there's links there to buy the book on Amazon, or you can look up Gavin Fry, F-R-Y-E, on Amazon, and the book is there. And um, there's, relative to this uh, sec- this subject, there's a chapter in the book called Intimate Relationship, The Ultimate Mirror, because it's a very powerful arena for growing as a, as, a, as a person, being in a healthy, intimate relationship that's authentic. And I talk a lot about all of that in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. If people listen to this, you know, brief interview that we've had this time, we got to sit and talk to each other and they took anything away from it. Like perhaps a good cue that you should pick up this book and learn more about yourself and your partner and your relationship. And if you do pick up this book, as I always remind people, leave a good review on Amazon mm. because those good reviews like propel your authors and these books that you enjoy upwards into yeah. the zone where other people get to see them more. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, that would be appreciated. I also, I'm going to start in January doing some online gatherings called Adventures in Authenticity with some experiential work that's with me one-on-one and it's it's relatively cost-effective. So that's a, that's another arena to touch into who I am and what I do. Awesome. Well, yeah. those are great. Thank you again for being yeah. on the show. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks so much, Colt, for having me. Do you feel more informed having listened to this episode of the Just Dumb Enough podcast? If so, please take a brief moment to rate the show five stars on iTunes, Spotify, or Audible. 
If you really liked it, remember to subscribe for more episodes and check out the nearly 100 episode backlog I've built up. Let me know what you'd like to hear by reaching out and emailing me, dumbenoughpodcast at gmail.com, or send a message on any of the show pages like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or wherever else you find me. I'm always looking for new topics, guest ideas, and questions from the audience. If you're looking to start your own podcast, I'd highly recommend using the host service I use, Podbean. You can find almost literally everything you could ever need to start an amazing show of your own at podbean.com. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com. They have incredible tools to make recording, hosting, cross-posting, promoting, and even monetizing incredibly easy. They are also built with an awesome support team behind the scenes that has always answered any question I've had in blazing fast time. The December rankings have begun. Number one, the United States, with Oregon, California, and Illinois as the top states. Number two, Australia, having stolen the top spot from the UK. Australia is led by New South Wales. Number three, the United Kingdom, slipping just slightly from their throne, but I'm confident they'll make a comeback soon. Number four, Canada, with Ontario holding the top province spot over from last month. And finally, number five, India making a return to the top five after a while. The numbers this month are incredibly close so far, and it could be anyone's for the taking. That's it for today. I'll see you all Thursday, the 8th, to find out what exactly costume jewelry is and why Hollywood wants it. Buh-bye. bye bye